Uh, so students, today we are going to be doing the current affairs for today and the recent topics. Now the first topic that we are going to be discussing is one of the most important topics from the perspective of international politics. Okay. Today, one of the zones which is extremely important from global geopolitics perspective is the Indo-Pacific region. Now, what is the Indo-Pacific region? Basically, there are contrasting opinions on from where to where the Indo-Pacific region extends to. While for uh, USA, this particular region extends from the western coast of India till the western coast of USA. For India, this particular zone extends from the eastern coast of Africa to the western coast of USA. This was given by Prime Minister Modi at the Shangri-La Dialogue. in Singapore. So, why is the Indo-Pacific so important? The Indo-Pacific is important because it is the nexus of developing countries. The Indo-Pacific encompasses developing nations such as China, India, Southeast Asia which holds the ASEAN. I am sure you know what the 10 ASEAN member states are. The ASEAN comprises of 10 nations such as Indonesia, Brunei, Singapore, Laos, Cambodia and the other countries. Please go through it. So since the Indo-Pacific comprises of these developing nations, the current hotbed is shifting from the Atlantic Ocean which was the earlier hotbed of trade between USA and Europe to this particular region which we spoke of eastern coast of Africa till the western coast of USA now there is increased engagement in this particular region if you look at this region around one third of the global trade just passes through this particular region it is the hotbed for Chinese expansionist activities China has been claiming the entire South China Sea as its own because of this it has gotten into conflicts with Philippines it has gotten into conflicts with Vietnam it has gotten into conflicts with Singapore Indonesia over the claims of its territories now China has also been accused of building artificial islands and claiming uh, and claiming certain other islands as its own to extend it to extend its reach in the South China Sea, like Paracel Islands, like Scarborough Shoal. All these islands are claimed or occupied by China. Paracel, Scarborough Shoal. increase Chinese hegemony and its territory in the region now the quad now moving on now recently the quad foreign ministers met in Melbourne in Australia now what is the purpose of this particular meet calling for justice for the 2611 terror attacks in Mumbai and the Pathan Court Air Base attack for the first time. The foreign ministers of Australia, India, Japan and the US said the Quad was already cooperating on sharing intelligence on threats in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, the Quad is a grouping of like-minded countries which are 
democracies and they believe in freedom of navigation and overflight in the Indo-Pacific region. It is as simple as that. Now, the Quad had upgraded its level of ties from foreign secretary level from foreign secretary level to foreign minister level to summit level which means at the level of the premiers prime minister in the case of India president in the case of USA Prime Minister in the case of Australia and uh, Prime Minister in the case of Japan. So, it has upgraded its ties to summit level. Now, what is the Quad? The Quad is a grouping of like-minded countries like what I said. Now, more about the current meeting of foreign ministers. The group of ministers held their fourth quad ministerial meeting in Melbourne. They resolved to speed up the delivery of more than a billion COVID-19 vaccines to be manufactured in India, to hold a special meeting on climate change this year, to step up efforts to ensure maritime security in the region of Indo-Pacific. The statement on their meet also made a veiled reference to China's actions in the South and East China Seas, reaffirming commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. The Quad member states are against aggression in the region. They are against Chinese expansionist activities in the region. They want a democratic environment in the region and they want freedom of navigation. They want the seas to be open to all and they need to be overflight in the region. They do not want any aggressive actions in the region. They also are against the debt trap diplomacy being uh, followed in the region, where debt is used as a weapon for occupying places. Now, however, there appeared divisions in their stand on global development, such as Russia-NATO tensions over Ukraine and sanctions against Myanmar's military. Why? Because Myanmar is a neighboring country of India. India cannot afford to have the same stand with respect to Myanmar as compared to a USA, which does not have a land boundary with Myanmar. Hence, USA can take a very idealistic stand when it comes to Myanmar. It can say that it will impose sanctions. However, when it comes to India, India has a land border with uh, Myanmar. We have a free trade regime which extends to about 16 kilometers which means that along the border of Myanmar and India both citizens of these countries can move to about 16 kilometers on either side of the border without any permits. The free movement regime. Now India does not support any individual sanctions on countries while the US does not mind taking the sanctions route against Myanmar to ensure that democracy is brought back into Myanmar. Hence, India's stand and Quad, other countries of Quad stand vary. The statement called for a return to democracy in Myanmar and also condemned North Korea's recent ballistic missile tests. As all of you know, North Korea has started practicing or started developing its nuclear missiles. And hence, the statement of the group, it supports democracy to be ensured in Myanmar and it supports uh, North Korea to abandon its missile testing program, nuclear missile testing program. Now, however, there is a criticism of the meet. We also saw that there were divergences in the views with regards to sanctions. There is also a criticism of the meet from the Chinese uh, foreign ministry, which uh, says that the entire concept of Quad is only a tool to contain China. Okay. 
this is the basics of quad you can please read it it's not now there exist certain challenges when it comes to the quad the quad is not structured like a typical multilateral organization and lacks a secretariat and any permanent decision making body now the problem with quad is that it is not a multilateral body it does not have any structure like a who or an imf it does not have a secretariat even like a sarc where is the secretariat of sarc please do comment now the answer about the secretariat of the sarc uh, it is in uh, kathmandu in nepal but uh, please do research read about the sarc it does not even have a secretariat so there is no proper coordination there are no proper rules regulations when it comes to the functioning of the quad also exercises such as malabar naval exercises are conducted however quad does not include provisions for collective defense like nato now what does the meaning of collective defense collective defense collective defense goes according to the concept of one for all and all for one which means that if at all any of the countries under nato are attacked all the countries will join together and attack the other country the same thing is happening the same thing would happen uh, what please do go through uh, when the nato was formed and where its uh, headquarters are what are the countries just have an overview of it no need to remember all the countries of nato no china opposed the formation of quad and has branded it as an emerging asian nato if it's nato it increases aggress it increases aggression in the region and hence china has branded it as a asian nato okay the next topic do not spread things to a larger level the supreme court observes on the hijab row context okay the supreme court on friday said that it will provide protection to the constitutional rights of petitioners and intervene at an appropriate time even as it cautioned against spreading of the controversy triggered by the hijab ban in karnataka classrooms to a national level there are chances that it might go out of proportion and it might result in large scale communal clashes now now what is the background of this entire issue the background of the issue lies in this particular section of the karnataka education act recently the karnataka government passed an order under the powers it has under section 133 clause 2 of the karnataka education act now what does the order say the order specifies that a head scarf is not a part of the uniform and thus women have been stopped from entering the campuses of educational institutions as the hijab comprises of a head scarf and hence since the order bans it it is not a part of the regular uniform and hence the students who are wearing the hijab have been stopped from entering into educational institutions now uh, that is a that is the crux of the issue now the issue is under karnataka karnataka high court if it is constitutional or not if the entire move if it's constitutional or not is in the realm of the karnataka high court which is hearing it however the karnataka high court as an interim order it has said that the students should not wear hijab or saffron shawls or use any religious flags while attending classes in karnataka colleges which have a prescribed uniform till the court decides the case uh, relating to ban on hijab the karnataka high court is going through petitions to see if the hijab forms a part of religious essential practices now religious essential practices are allowed they cannot be banned under article 25 freedom of religion 
Now, the Karnataka High Court is going to examine if the concept of hijab comes under religious essential practices. If it does come under it, then people will be allowed to wear it to educational institutions. For now, it has held as an interim order that people should not wear any of these religious symbols when attending educational institutions. This is the background of the issue. However, what are the issues? What are the problems in this article? Wearing a hijab is an expression protected under Article 19 Clause 1 Clause A of the Constitution which guarantees the right to freedom of speech and expression. I'm sure you know what Article 19 Clause uh, 1 Subclause A is. Please read it. Constitutionally, under Article 19 Clause 2, there are certain provisions under uh, the said 19 Clause 2 where the rights under 19 Clause A are not applicable. So, the, right, uh, the, the things that are mentioned under Article 19 Clause 2 are whenever an issue uh, concerns the sovereignty and integrity of India or friendly relations with foreign states or public order or decency or morality or in relation to contempt of the courts, defamation or incitement of an offence, then Article uh, 19 Clause A, Subclause A is not applicable. Over here, the right to freedom of speech and expression is not applicable. These are the exceptions to right to freedom of speech and expressions. However, a student who is silently wearing hijab or a headscarf and attending classrooms cannot in any manner said to be a person who disturbs public order. Why? Only public order? Oh, under public order, it is that there is a concern saying that it cannot be allowed. But a person who is silently attending classrooms, can it be said that that person is against public order? I personally do not think so. It is a debatable uh, concept. It is left to the Karnataka High Court to decide and give a verdict. Ban on headscarves violates the fundamental right to equality. Why? Under which, what is the article over here? Article 14, the right to equality states that all people equally located have to be treated equally. Other religious in markers such as wearing a turban worn by a Sikh are not explicitly prohibited. So why is it that this one particular headscarf is being prohibited? Hence it goes against Article 14. These are the issues that are there surrounding the headscarf. Uh, now we will wait because it is a matter which is subjudice hence we are not allowed to comment on it recklessly we will wait for the karnataka high court to come up with a verdict and then we can analyze the situation index of industrial production growth slowed to 0.4 percent in december now the index of industrial production it measures the manufacturing growth or it measures the output given by factories over a said period of time usually the index of industrial production measures it with a time period of around one one month uh, say for example the industrial the index of industrial production for December is compared against the index of industrial production of uh, December 2021. So as compared to December 2021, how much is the growth in industrial production in December 2022? This percentage of growth is what makes the index of industrial production. Now, according to the news article, it says that India's industrial recovery slowed sharply in December with factory output growing just 0.4% year on year and manufacturing actually shrinking 0.1%. The 
The index of industrial production is an index that shows the growth rates in different industries of the economy. It's compiled and published monthly by the Central Statistical Organization. Please read the hierarchy of the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. What is the National Statistical Commission? What is the Central Statistical Organization? What is the NSSO? Please read all these things and the composition of the National Statistical Commission. If it's a statutory body, if it's an executive body, if it's a constitutional body, please read all those uh, details about it because they are highly probable to be asked in the prelims exam. Now, the IIP is a composite indicator that measures the growth rate of industry groups classified under sectors such as mining, manufacturing and electricity. Out of this entire thing, manufacturing has the highest weightage in the index of industrial production and that particular thing has contracted by 0.1% as we read in the news above. Now, mining has a weightage of about 14% and electricity has a weightage of about 8% in the index of industrial production. The base year for index of industrial production is 2011-12. Now, out of the index of industrial production, we have eight core industries. These eight core industries, what are they? They are electricity, crude oil, coal, cement, steel, refinery products, natural gas, and fertilizers. These are the eight core industries in the index of industrial production. Now, why are they called eight core industries? Because they account for more than 40% of share in the index. 40% weightage is just given to these eight core industries. And hence, these are known as the core industries. Now, please remember the details. It's a very factual idea. Uh, it's a very factual concept. Now, the speaker rejects a plea. Context. The West Bengal Assembly Speaker on Friday rejected a petition by legislators seeking the disqualification of other members on the grounds that they defected. The West Bengal Speaker has rejected certain petitions which are asking him to disqualify people because of defection. Now, what is the role of the Speaker of Lok Sabha? The role of the uh, Speaker of the Lok Sabha is the interpretation. This is the most important role of the Speaker. He or she is the final interpreter of the provisions of the Constitution of India, the rules of the, pro rules of the procedure and conduct of business of Lok Sabha and the parliamentary precedence within the house. What does this mean? This means that whatsoever the speaker interprets of the constitution, of the rules of procedure, of the business of the house, of the privileges of the members, that is final. It is the, the speaker has the supreme authority within the house. He or she presides over a joint sitting of the two houses of parliament. Now, please read about the joint sitting of the two houses of the parliament. What are the two houses of the parliament? The Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha. Now, what happens in this joint sitting? The uh, It is the uh, speaker of the Lok Sabha who presides over a joint sitting. And uh, the rules of procedure of the Lok Sabha are followed for even the joint sitting. Now, what are the bills that a joint sitting of the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha cannot preside over? Can it preside over a constitutional amendment bill? Can it preside over uh, disqualification of members? Disqual uh, the disqualification of, say, the chief election commissioner? Please do read about it the joint sitting of the 
two member uh, two houses similarly the speaker can adjourn the house or suspend the meeting in the absence of one tenth of the total strength of the house this is known as the quorum of the house the speaker ordinarily does not have a vote however he possesses the casting vote which means that if at all there exists a tie he acts as the tiebreaker person he votes at the end of the entire vote now whatever bill is signed by the speaker as a money bill then it remains a money bill he is the not he is the authority who certifies a bill to be a money bill and i believe you know what is the importance of a money bill the rajya sabha does not have powers equivalent to that of a lok sabha in the case of a money bill in the case of a money bill the rajya sabha does not have amending powers it cannot reject the money bill it only has delaying powers it can delay the bill only for a period of about 14 days and even the suggestions which are given by the rajya sabha either may or may not be accepted by the lok sabha similarly there exist other powers of the speaker sure you can read it there are certain other powers of the speaker very ordinary powers you can read it it is very straight forward now we'll read about the anti defection law so anti defection law was not present at the time of writing the constitution it was introduced much later through the 52nd amendment act the 52nd amendment act created the 10th schedule now the anti defection law punishes individual members of the parliament mps mlas for leaving one party for the sake of another after being elected the parliament added it to the constitution as the 10th schedule in 1985 in the 52nd amendment act grounds for disqualification of members when do we remove the member who is a part of Uh, for disqualify uh, for uh, anti defection if a member if an elected member voluntarily gives up his membership of the political party on whose seat he got elected if he voluntarily gives it up he can be disqualified if he votes or abstains from voting in such house contrary to any di- direction issued by his political party or anyone authorized to do so without obtaining the prior permission of the party if he votes against the direction of the party then he can be removed under the provisions of anti defection if any independently elected member joins any political party he can be removed if a nominated member joins any political party after 6 months then he can be removed under anti defection however there exist certain exceptions a member's actions are if an a member's actions are condoned if they are forgiven by the party or authorized person within 15 days of such incident then he is not likely to be dismissed under provisions of anti defection and the 92nd constitutional amendment act it had changed the provisions of the 10th schedule and allows at least two thirds of the members of a party to go for a merger and in the case of a merger if at all two thirds of the members of a particular political party decide to move away and they decide to shift from one political party to another political party then it is known as a merger and in this particular case provisions of anti defection are not applicable now what are the issues that exist with anti defection after enactment of the anti defection law the mp or mla has to follow the party's directions blindly and has no freedom to vote their judgment see in this case what is the role of a parliament the role of the parliament is to hold the executive accountable if if a member of the parliament is actually under the directions or the whip of the party will he hold the executive accountable will he question the executive that doesn't happen 
it goes against the freedom of speech and expression of the member also first the accountability is affected second thing is that the freedom of speech and expression which is necessary in the parliament is also affected due to anti defection law the chain of accountability has been broken by making legislators accountable primarily to the political party it is accountable to the political party rather than uh, to the actual parliament in many instances the speaker usually from the ruling party has delayed deciding on the disqualification if you had noticed in the 10th schedule there is no particular time period given hence the speaker either delays it or he abuses his power he is the ultimate authority to disqualify members so the speaker delays or uses his powers under the anti defection law to the advantage of his party members and that casts a doubt on the role of the speaker now uh, ideally the speaker is supposed to be non partisan when it comes to anti defection law now please do read if the actions of the speaker are open to judicial review in the kehoto holohan case in the kehoto holohan case k i h o t o holohan case the supreme court held that the actions of the speaker fall under judicial review because the actions resemble the working of a tribunal see the speaker is performing a quasi judicial role over here and since he is performing a quasi judicial role the supreme court can have a judicial review of the actions of the speaker is the verdict of the supreme court in the kehoto holohan case now this is a problem the concept of merger is allowed now merger it causes big defections while small defections are not allowed big defections are still allowed and that is a problem defection is the subversion of electoral mandates by legislators who get elected on the ticket of one party but find it convenient to shift to another you are cheating the you are cheating the public who have voted for you thinking that you will be in this particular political party when you are jumping it means that you are betraying their trust and that is a problem and it also promotes horse trading horse trading means trading of legislators like horses like a commodity this increases money and muscle power in politics it promotes criminalization of politics hence it's a problem the navy navy's milan exercise to bring together 46 countries this is one of the largest exercises the navy is set to hold the 12th presidential presidential president's fleet, fleet review on february 21st at visakhapatnam this is the headquarters of the eastern command later it will hold the largest multilateral exercise in this region known as milan 2022 which will see participation of all major navies including the quad countries what are the quad countries we had discussed above russia and from west asia amid tensions in ukraine what are the tensions in ukraine russia has moved its troops to the border of ukraine in 2014 russia had already annexed crimea which was till then a part of ukraine now russia has moved its troops closer to the border of ukraine there is a region in ukraine known as the donbas region which has a large number of russian speaking population and this has been a region which has been in tension there is it is restive there are uh, there are uh, movements for liberation from ukraine and to join russia it is known that russia is actively supporting the separatist element in this donbas region now russia has moved its troops closer to the border with ukraine
in the middle of all of this india is uh, conducting actually its uh, milan 2022 uh, exercise and quad countries are participating in it what is the exercise what is the other exercise which all the quad countries are participating in it is known as please do comment in the comment section it will be uh, good for uh, for prelims i have mentioned it above in case if you don't know so please go through it more on the news this year's milan exercise will see the participation of all quad countries with the us being invited for the first time the us is being invited for the milan exercise for the first time till now it has never been in involved in the milan exercise this is for the first time that it is being involved now what does this mean this means that all the quad countries are participating this increases uh, tensions for china and with china china already brands quad as a asian nato so when they are conducting exercises together it increases their interoperability and this threatens china now the entire exercise has several themes such as anti submarine warfare among others along with deliberations talks including by subject matter experts navy will also be showcasing majorly its deep submergence rescue vessel this is a new vessel developed by the navy it's a new technology and the role of this particular technology is to help and to rescue submarines which are at very low depths at low depths means under high pressure hence the role of this particular vessel is to ensure that these uh, submarines can be rescued now milan exercise is a biennial exercise which means that it is conducted only once in 2 years it is a multilateral naval exercise which started in 1995 and is hosted by the indian navy it is held under the aegis of the eastern naval command which is headquartered in visakhapatnam okay the most important topic for the day chinese troops entered indian territory and drove away herders according to a local official now chinese soldiers entered indian territory on january 28th in ladakh and stopped local people from grazing their herd in the area a local official has alleged now we have to understand why chinese troops are constantly entering into our part of into our territory into indian territory if you see kashmir this is a rough uh, rough sketch this part is known as aksai and the border that india shares with china over here at the aksai chin is known as the line of actual control it is known as the line of actual control this is different from the border that we have with pakistan which is known as the line of control over here we have the line of control over here we have the line of actual control now the issue is that india and china have border issues across their entire uh, border it is about 3000 kilometers and in the in the eastern part of the border let's say this is the let us say this is the border that india shares along with china over here we have arunachal pradesh over here we have jammu and kashmir the eastern part of the border india supports the mek mahon line
which the Britishers actually drew along with representatives from Tibet and representatives from China. However, China does not recognize this line. According to this line, Thawang, Arunachal Pradesh all fall within India's territories. In the middle sector, it is a pretty peaceful territory. The border is demarcated and there aren't many issues. Except at one place known as Barahoti Plains. And in the western sector, over here is where the conflict actually lies, where the line of actual control is. Over here, India, over here there exist two lines. India supports the Johnson line. According to this particular line, Aksai Chin falls under the territory of India. It falls within Jammu and Kashmir. Aksai Chin belongs to India. However, China believes in the McDonald line. According to this particular line, Aksai Chin belongs to China. Since there exist two particular lines and there exists a conflict regarding which particular territory belongs to who, this leads to tensions between the two countries. Now, moving on. There are certain re uh, recent events that happened which are triggering tensions. Some of them are China recently renamed 15 places in Arunachal Pradesh and justifies the renaming as being done on the basis of its historical, cultural and administrative jurisdiction over the area. So China actually has these tactics known as the salami tactics. known as salami tactics salami slicing according to which it takes small small steps and these steps when they are seen individually you know it doesn't seem as much but when these and all these steps are taken in totality when they're taken together it ensures in a giant leap for example China starts uh, improving infrastructure along its border it starts asking its herders to move into Indian territory. It starts renaming the places within Indian territory. Slowly, it will ensure that its troops start patrolling that area. And slowly, it will change the border. It will come in and start taking over the territory. So when you see these events individually, they don't seem as much. But when you look at all these events together, then it seems as much. It, it will result into a large land grabbing incident for China. Now, the other issue is China's new land border law came into force on January 1st, 2022. Now, what does this land border law say? It says that the People's Liberation Army, which is the official army of the People's Republic of China, it has full responsibility to take steps against invasion, encroachment, infiltration, provocation and safeguard Chinese territory. So now they have made a law and they cannot go back on this law. China is also constructing a bridge on the Pangongso Lake which is claimed by India as its territory. Now this Pangongso Lake is a very strategic uh, space. Also apart from this, China has built a bullet train from Lhasa to Nyingchi. This virtually lies just across the border of India and this will ensure that the troop movement is faster. Chinese troops can move faster, they can be relocated faster to the border of India in case a tense situation arises. So China has been doing a lot of actions along the border. Now, now what is the 
issue we will go in further deep to understand the issue along the pangong so lake let me show you what the pangong so lake might look like my drawing is a little bad so you'll just have to adjust with it the pangong so lake has regions known as fingers let's say this is the pangong so lake this is how it extends and over here it is towards china and over here it is towards india over here we have mountains and valleys and these are known as fingers finger 1 finger 2 finger 3 finger 4 finger 5 and till finger 8 which is closer towards the chinese border now there arises an issue regarding the demarcation of these fingers between india and china they have a different understanding where the line of actual control passes through india has maintained that the line of actual control passes through finger 8 which is over here while uh china on the other hand says that the line of actual control passes through finger 2 you see the difference india says that the line of actual control is finger 8 which means that this entire region belongs to india while china says that the line of actual control passes through finger 2 which means that this entire region is china's and hence there is a conflict between who controls this region India tries to patrol till here China tries to patrol till here and these patrolling points when they meet each other there is conflict and there is uh, fighting or there is fist uh, hand to hand combat because along the line of actual control we don't use weapons unlike the line of uh, line of control along with Pakistan and hence they use spades they use clubs they use hand to hand combat in order to fight with each other now recently i'm sure you must have heard about the galwan valley clash now after the galwan valley clash happened there exist india and uh, okay, india and china have engaged at multiple points such as galwan debsang plains then gogra hot springs gogra hot springs pangong so so recently after the galwan valley clash happened the indian troops and the chinese troops have engaged at all these places which means that they got into they got into confrontations at all these places however because of talks the border dialogue please do read how many rounds of talks have happened across the border between india and china and during these talks it has been ensured that disengagement has happened at pangong so disengagement has happened along debsang plains and disengagement has happened along galwan valley however diseng disengagement has happened ac ac across gogra however disengagement is yet to happen at hot springs or i believe disengagement has happened at hot springs and the disengagement is yet to happen at gogra so uh, most of the other places disengagement has happened and only one of these two places disengagement is yet to happen and the troops are still in a combat mode pangong so is a strategically crucial area as it is very close to the chushul valley which was one of the battle fronts between india and china during the 1962 war and hence china is actually building a bridge across the pangong so lake to reduce its travel time to move its troops to the battle front 
China owns or China controls about two thirds of the Pangong So. While India controls only one third of Pangong So. Now China is building a bridge across the territory of Pangong So that it controls so that it can reduce its travel time for the troops to reach the dispute area. China also does not want India to boost its infrastructure anywhere near the line of actual control. China fears it threatens the occupation of Aksai Chin and Lhasa Kashgarwa Highway. Currently, China is in occupation of the Aksai Chin region. Aksai Chin region, like what I said earlier, if you notice Kashmir, this region is known as Aksai Chin. Now this region is controlled by China because it won it during the 1962 war. So China feels that if India develops infrastructure along the border then its Aksai Chin uh, occupation is under threat. And hence China opposes Indian infrastructure along the border. India tried, India has been constructing the Darbuk Shok. Daulat Beg Oldi Highway India has been constructing this particular highway which connect which connect the lowermost point of Ladakh to the uppermost point of Ladakh. Now if India constructs this highway and if India improves the infrastructure in Kashmir along the line of actual control, then it threatens Chinese positions. So China is apprehensive about this highway. And China also believes that this might threaten the Lhasa Kashgar highway. And hence, uh, China opposes Indian infrastructure over there. So these are the reasons why confrontations are happening. Please do read uh, about the issue more if you are interested in it. I have given a good background of the issue. Thank you.